start with and just say who you are and what you do. Um, Jefferson County Commissioner Kate Dean. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Commissioner from District 1. And um, I have the pleasure of uh, being the county's representative on the Climate Action Committee. And as you'll hear in my presentation, worked uh, closely with NODC on uh, climate change planning before getting elected. So this issue is near and dear. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Kay. And now we have John Warrow, City Manager of the City of Port Townsend. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm City Manager. I feel like uh, climate change is a key responsibility of my role. Um, I've also spent a number of years working on climate issues as the Chief Sustainability Officer at Auckland Council in New Zealand, among other roles. So great to be here. Thanks. Now we're going to hear from Karen Affeld, Executive Director for the North Olympic Development Council. Hi, I'm Karen Affeld, Executive Director of North Olympic Development Council, or NODC. Um, I've been in the role for five years, and Kate Dean was my predecessor, so great to have us both here. Um, NODC is the Regional Economic Development District for Jefferson and Clallam Counties, and one of our roles is regional planning, uh, and so we've been very engaged in uh, climate change and disaster resilience planning in addition to economic development. And following Karen, we have Eric Tews, Deputy Director of the Port of Port Townsend. Thank you, Arlene, and good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Taves, Deputy Director, and um, the port, as um, most in the community know, is particularly vulnerable to the effects of sea level rise and climate change. With nearly all of the port's holdings uh, at or near sea level throughout the county, with the exception of the Jefferson County International Airport. Um, and those uh, port properties play host to um, critical schools in our community, and somewhere on the order of uh, direct jobs here at Bow Haven and Port Townsend and Bowen and more than 2,200 direct, indirect, and induced jobs throughout the county. So we're keenly interested in um, being prepared for, adapting to, uh, and maintaining our resilience in the interests of uh, sustaining not only our local economy, but the uh, character and heritage of our community. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And now we have Emily Moore, Assistant Planner. Uh, Jefferson County Department of Community Development. Hello, good morning. My name is Emily Weimer. I'm an assistant planner here at Community Development. And my background has been in tribal transit policy. And I also previously worked for the National Park Service as an archaeologist and as a wildland firefighter. So issues of climate change are very near and dear to me and something I've experienced firsthand um, in my work. Thanks, Emily, and welcome to uh, DCD. Thank you. Um, and now we have Jeff Randall, PUD Commissioner, District 1. So my name is Jeff Randall, and I'm a commissioner for the PUD 1 of 3. And the PUD since 2013 has been offering 98% uh, clean electricity to the residents of East Jefferson County. And we also provide water services in the county, as well as we can provide sewer and uh, Provide high speed broadband, which we are working on to provide for the whole East Coast. And my background is in land use planning. Um, I'm also educated as an attorney and worked in the solar industry for about 10 years. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Jeff. And now I have the privilege of passing the voice of this meeting over to Kate Dean. Kate, take it away. Great, thank you. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, of course, there'll be a little bit of a delay in that. I apologize. Make sure I have it on the right view. Um, I want to um, first off acknowledge that there are many people in the room here today who have a lot of experience um, in climate change. Many of you are experts, I dare say. Um, and so I really um, hope that we can have a, a robust conversation um, via chat um, or otherwise. Um, is that my screen showing properly? Great. Um, uh, so please do use that chat function um, and really appreciate any, any input that you have. A lot, of, a lot of folks here have been working in this space for a long time as well. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, there are a lot of the work that has been done in Jefferson County on climate change has been driven by community engagement and volunteers. And um, the unfortunately Cindy Jane from Climate Action Committee could not be here today, but she and her team, as well as Local 2020, the Transportation Lab, T-Lab, um, they have been really just incredible um, uh, kind of uh, resources and, and warriors. We have some incredible expertise in this community and we would not be as far along as we are if it weren't for that volunteer effort, um, in large part because up until recently, there's been very little funding available for local governments. So um, I'm gonna try and do a really high overview of some of the work that's been done to date. Um, I'm, I'm gonna quickly go through some projected impacts that uh, a project um, that I worked on with NODC with a number of you actually participating. Um, and we were able to kind of pull together projected impacts from the best available science in 2015. Uh, keep in mind that that, that science has been um, updated and I imagine NODC might be able to drill a little deeper into, into impacts um, in the work that they're doing currently. Um, and just give you a flavor of kind of what has been done to date, what resources are available, and you can dive further into all of those. I'm not going to do a deep dive on them, but so this is just kind of place setting and then show you kind of the work that we're doing with, um, with Climate Action Committee and I'm going to ask John Morrow to join me in any portion of this conversation because much of this work has been joint city county again with organizations and volunteers galore chipping in. So um, I'm just going to call out this report that the NODC created in 2015. Um, it was uh, the first rural uh, climate change planning project that the EPA funded. Um, and proud, proud that we were able to kind of be a pioneer in that space. This included Jefferson and Clallam counties, mostly on the, uh, the straight side of the peninsula, not Hood Canal. So it's a little bit limited in its scope. Um, some of the things it includes, um, uh, I'll dig in a little bit to the, the risks and impacts that we anticipate um, here locally on the peninsula. Again, really trying to drill down into the local, which was our task for today. Um, I, I couldn't actually tell if that's John Bellow, the farming picture who's on, if John's on the call today. Um, it looks a lot like you, John, but I can't tell. And it looks like it came from, from Google. So who knows, um, John, you're welcome to, to chime in if that's you or not. Um, so um, we anticipate increased uh, temperatures, which we're not feeling that currently uh, this spring, but we know, you know, it's global weirding, or uh, climate weirding as much it is, as it is global warming. Um, so obviously in a cool cycle right now, but we can anticipate um, temperatures increase to about eight degrees um, in the in August and about five degree increase in January. Um, decreased rainfall in August, increased rainfall in November. So um, just a little bit of data there. Um, and and this also represents a pretty major shift. Um, you'll see in the historical data there, the state of Washington, and particularly the Olympic Peninsula, um, we have largely a, a, a transition, snow and uh, snow and rain, where how our pre precipitation falls, um, which is you know very much equated to how we store water for summer months, um, and across the state we see that. Um, increasing to rain dominant. So most precipitation falling is rain, therefore require different ways of capturing for, um, for to have sufficient water in the summer months. So by 2040, that has shrunk, you know, the, the transition, basically the ability of glaciers and snow to capture precipitation um, and disappearing by 2080 altogether. And as a reminder, many of our water supplies are dependent on snowpack here on the peninsula. Um, uh, we can expect to see increased stream temperature across the peninsula. Um, you'll see that's a, uh, the, the darkest red is about 1.4 degrees Celsius increase um, and uh, widespread most of the streams in lowland areas of Jefferson County are 1.4 to 1.2. Uh, degree Celsius increase, which is really significant for, for uh, the ability of salmon to spawn in particular. 
Um, and um, then we did a lot of work in sea level rise in this project in 2015. Um, and something a little bit unique about the work that we did, and this was primarily under uh, the work of Dr. Ian Miller with Sea Grant, um, but was looking at the, the probabilities of sea level rise, somewhat based on um, the emissions. So there's just many of you know, probably there's a number of assumptions that go into climate change planning. Uh, a very important one is what emissions scenario do we anticipate? Um, but then there's also just probability. Um, and so you'll see here there's um, and I'm, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into some of the mapping work that was done, but, you know, we can anticipate about a 50% chance of 0.09 feet in, by 2050 and uh, greater than 2.4 feet in 2100 sea level rise here in Port Townsend. Again, this is really high level. Dig in further to the report if you're interested. Um, I actually think that the mapping work that was done is, is some of the most interesting work to look at. There were only a few sites along the peninsula that were chosen to do this level of detail. I will say that there is a great work done by NOAA. NOAA has something called the Sea Level Rise Viewer. It's easy to find online where you can um, get a little more localized data. Um, they also chose Port Townsend as their the site uh, on the, uh, in Jefferson County that has the most specific data. Um, but I wanna call out a couple of things here. Um, that so you'll see that again this is probabilistic so the the lighter the color blue any of the blue on the map here is inundation the lighter the color is the more likely that is to be inundated in the year uh, specified at the top of the map the darker blue less likely but possible and i chose to show here are storm flooded areas um, and we are already experiencing storm surge when coupled with high tides is when we currently experience, um, uh, you know, problematic events uh, on our shorelines. So um, take a look at these maps if you're interested, dig into the NOAA work. Um, you know, it, it does, it raises a lot of questions and, you know, I, I'm sure that Eric Taves will dig into this further with the port. Um, you know, this is, this is really the, the multi-billion dollar question, right? How do we make decisions about where we put infrastructure? What do we do with a historic downtown that is vulnerable? Um, and uh, Karen and John are gonna dig a little bit further into that very issue. Um, I wanna call out here, the report does specify just how much critical infrastructure on the peninsula is vulnerable to sea level rise. No surprise to any of you. Um, and then we know too that there's a number of human health uh, impacts that we can anticipate from climate change. Um, emerging biotoxins, infectious disease. It's interesting, we, you know, some question as to how much the pandemic is related to disappearing uh, habitat for species that, that carry zoonotic diseases, but we also experience things like increased uh, red tides, biotoxins in the shellfish industry, obviously heat wave, smoke, we don't even have on this list. This is 2015 before we were seeing almost annual smoke events, uh, concerns about food security, and then a lot of extreme weather events and the, the accidents that those cause. And then of course the question of, you know, will we see an exodus here to this region um, when most of the country, if you look at a map, is in, you know, dark red and brown colors and we're a little oasis of green. Uh, you know, how do we handle an influx of people. Um, it'd be really interesting to see the, the growth over the last couple of years. Those, that data is, is just starting to come in. Um, this, we're already seeing some demographic shifts because of the pandemic. Um, our growth has ticked up a little bit, although it's harder to track when it's um, a lot of second home. Um, those demographics are, are harder for us to track, so we're just trying to get an idea of are, are we seeing this growth already? Did the pandemic exacerbate uh, my, in migration to the region? Um, so just to point out real quickly, we're not gonna go through these, but um, the report does call out, that we did a, a ranking um, and a sensitivity analysis with about 200 stakeholders to identify the top 10 strategies in three different categories. So these are the, the what were ranked as the most pressing critical issues um, to address in the region. So we've got ecosystems, water supplies, critical infrastructure. Again, just showing you so you know what has been done and you can look it up if you're interested. 
and I'll say again, the challenge is that, you know, we were able to identify all of these uh, strategies and yet there's been very little funding available to implement them. And so NODC and Karen will talk a little bit more about um, the work that's being done. And finally, I'd say that the, the federal government and the state stepping up to try to fund more of these, uh, taking more seriously the responsibility of local governments to be planning uh, for climate change, just like we do for so many other uh, disasters and events. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump into our very local work of the Climate Action Committee. This committee was formed in 2017, a joint city county committee. Uh, many of the, the uh, partners are situated here with us today, city, county, port, PUD, Jefferson Healthcare, Jefferson Transit, Port Townsend Paper Company, and then citizen representatives. Um, and it, it's, I can't even just say citizen representatives. I mean, these are people who, you know, like work for the World Bank and or people who have done climate change research in Antarctica. And these are like really highly skilled people who uh, volunteer their time. Uh, the group was formed with the goal of uh, achieving an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels by the year 2050. Um, that is uh, probably not enough. Uh, we are, are considering revising that goal to be more in line with the latest um, IPCC reports and uh, uh, be more aligned with international um, agreed upon uh, targets for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there was a greenhouse gas inventory uh, completed. It was completed in 2021 using 2018 data. So that was, it was slowed down a little bit by uh, the pandemic. And we had a baseline from 2015, or excuse me, 20, uh, 2005. Um, and you'll see we, you know, in 2018, we had already uh, reduced emissions by about 40%. Um, a lot of that in what's called stationary energy, and we'll dive a little bit further into that in a minute. Um, you know, pretty drastic from 289,000 metric tons of CO2 to 86,000. So great, you're very much headed in the right direction. Um, and then you see transportation um, as a significant uptick. Uh, so headed in the wrong direction with transportation. We'll talk more about. Um, just again, pointing out some of the resources available in this inventory of emissions. Um, there are two different uh, ways that we measured our emissions here in Jefferson County. The one on the right is our what's called community-wide emissions. So that's taking everything that is emitted from the, um, the, the uses of, of greenhouse gas emitting materials in the county and shows very strong 66% transportation. We know that that is our low hanging fruit in terms of where we are creating emissions. But if you take a look at the, the figure on the left, it's much more diverse. That is taking a look at everything that we use. So instead of um, externalizing the climate impacts of things like um, appliances, which are not you know, created here, they're built likely overseas. If you actually looked at what we buy, what we consume here, this would be our, our carbon footprint here on the left-hand side. So some, some pretty, um, detailed research went into this and we, we explore both in the report. Coming out of that um, inventory, then this, uh, uh, the Climate Action Committee with a lot of community partners um, worked on the uh, emissions reduction opportunities. So again, did some deep dive work and identified that the, this is 11 strategies that would be most likely to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. None of them are drastic, um, and some of them don't go far enough. Uh, you know, folks would say, "Is that should we be promoting electric vehicle? Um, is that the answer? Or do we need to to do something more radical?" And that's a a, a real question. Um, but we do see the biggest impact: ten percent reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions were we to simply promote uh, and incentivize the use of more electric vehicles. I really wanna call out here how much Jefferson Transit has been at the table and a part of this conversation and is committed to transit being a part of the solution and um, uh, appreciate their willingness to work with all the volunteers in the community and the Climate Action Committee to, to really you know, hold more space in, um, in climate solutions. Um, the most recent work that the Climate Action Committee has created is this uh, greenhouse gas inventory for forestry and trees. And this is really important because we know obviously forested community. Um, so did a deep dive on where, you know, what is the role of 
industrial forestry? Is it a net emitter of carbon or is it a net sequesterer? And we came up with some surprising answers. Um, a lot of commercial forestry, industrial based commercial forestry is actually by our standard using this ICLE um, software shows to be um, uh, emitting more greenhouse gases than it is sequestering. So you know, we can use data like this to look at uh, policy, to think about how we how we manage forests that the county owns. Um, so really, just really valuable work. So this is just to give you again an overview of what's happening in the county, city, um, and, and some of the, the partner work that we are doing. And with that, um, John Morrow, I'm curious if you have anything to add. Um, I, I think I'll make sure we can get around to everybody else and just emphasize the um, volunteer-led community effort, um, as well as the um, the fact that I, I think about our city council and elected decision makers and how not only do they sit on the climate action committee, um, but they sit on other very related um, committees and advisory bodies like Jefferson Transit. I'm thinking about um, you know infrastructure and development. I'm thinking about um, the EDC. Um, so so in effect, all city council members of the city, and I think all commissioners, uh, PUD, county, and port, actually have an active um, policy making role around climate change. I think that's good to remember. Um, and I guess maybe the last thing I'll just shout out about the state situation and federal situation. That's a um, an interesting landscape um, that we're navigating from a funding and a policy perspective where Washington state is moving pretty quickly uh, on a number of fronts related to, to climate change. Okay, that's it from me. Happy to um, have take questions in the chat uh, at the end as well. Arlene, I can't remember who I'm handing it off to. So, okay, so we will now go to um, Karen Affeld. Great, and um, Kate is gonna share uh, the slides for me. Perfect. Great. Um, so um, NRDC has been doing some work this year and, and last year, we'll continue for the rest of this year to build on the work that was done in 2015. As Kate said, um, the 2015 report um, had, did a wonderful job of uh, identifying what the risks were and uh, making some recommendations about ways to move forward. But because of, uh, of lack of funding, um, it's been challenging to make some of those things happen. And so we sought funding to work on uh, some regional planning work to focus specifically in on uh, working with local governments and local tribes and some of our federal agencies to, uh, to do concrete planning for setting goals on things we can work, work towards together and strategies. And then we'll be looking at, okay, how do we fund that work? Um, so, uh, and I wanna emphasize that uh, um, all of the agencies around the table here are represented in that, in that work. Um, Cindy Jane, who Kate mentioned uh, from the CAC is on the steering committee for the work. Um, uh, John Morrow is also on the steering committee. Um, it's, the, it's, a, it's a very much a regional effort. Kate, you wanna move on? Next slide. So uh, just a brief overview of the Regional Climate Change Planning Project to start with. Next slide. Um, so building on the previous work, um, we're supporting tribes, local governments, and agencies to implement coordinated climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies in the two counties. Next slide. There are three primary tasks that we're gonna do this with. Um, one, um, we've hired Cascadia Consulting Group and they're helping to facilitate a series of three region-wide strategy meetings to agree on regional climate change priorities and set actions. Um, and these are things that are, that are gonna require regional coordination and collaboration. So it is very much local, but it's local to Jefferson and Clallam counties and, and not, uh, not hyper-local. Um, and these are things that we'll need to work on more regionally as opposed to 
um, the, the most local actions. We're also gonna be developing a climate change implementation toolkit that will support um, the work of the local governments. One of the things that we found was a barrier in some cases, once a community has a climate change um, action plan in place is, is, okay, so we've said we're gonna do these things, how do we do them? How do we make this happen? And uh, when you go looking for examples um, of how to move forward, many of them are, are from large cities. And so maybe not as workable um, in rural areas. So this toolkit is gonna be based on uh, NODC's website. It will be searchable and it will have things like model code that can be used, um, model permitting processes, uh, educational materials, just kind of a whole range of things so that when you decide you wanna work on something, um, you, can, uh, um, you can find a tool that will help you get there. Um, and then finally, um, we recognize that one of the main barriers to moving forward was that local governments don't have, um, don't have the resources. So part of the grant uh, is to have uh, Cascadia Consulting Group actually work and provide technical assistance to four local governments. Um, next slide. For the region-wide strategy meetings, we've already held the first two. One was February 18th, where we tried to identify regional climate change priorities. Um, on April 1st, we met again to try to refine those priorities and develop strategies. The third meeting is scheduled for May 25th from 1 to 4 p.m. And that's where we'll finalize strategies and metrics and really kind of identify what the next steps are gonna be. Um, through this whole process, we've been trying to find um, gradients of agreement uh, because we really want the, there to be strong agreement and consensus on the, the goals and the strategies that we choose to work on going forward. And so in between meetings, there's a lot of work um, surveying folks and then compiling the results of those surveys and then getting in touch and saying, okay, there doesn't seem to be agreement on this. You know, um, where, where can we give, how do we move forward? Next slide. For the implementation toolkit, um, we've identified three focus areas. Uh, there's transportation and land use, energy and buildings, and water. And again, the focus is on implementation, code templates, educational materials, and on things that are relevant here and that are relevant in rural areas. And it will be on our website. Next slide. Uh, for the technical assistance for local governments, we put out a really simple request for applications. Um, and we got five proposals from, from area governments. Um, and uh, the four that were selected were the Jamestown Scalum tribe, the city of Port Townsend, and John is gonna talk about that a little further, um, city of Port Angeles and Clallam County. And I think the interesting thing is that all of these local governments are, are working on, um, on climate change, but they're in really different places. So for instance, Clallam County does not yet have a climate action plan. And so they're really working on uh, strategy development, beginning a climate action plan, and they have actually uh, found money separately to hire Cascadia to work on a greenhouse gas inventory because they don't even have that. Um, and city of Port Angeles is just completing their climate action plan. And so they're focusing on implementation planning. Um, uh, Port Townsend has done quite a bit of work and so has the Jamestown Sklalem tribe. And so, uh, so they're looking at more specific pieces of the work. Um, next slide. Uh, so as we were working on that process, um, we, um, one of the things that came up a lot was that we're already seeing climate impacts on the peninsula. We've had a heat dome, we've had some wildfires, we've had um, uh, flooding and landslides um, in areas that, that weren't previously seeing those. And um, uh, so the question came up, you know, how do we respond to these natural disasters and, and um, how can we be more resilient um, and particularly looking at all the federal funding that is coming down right now for infrastructure. You know, are there infrastructure um, pieces? Are there things that we can strengthen both uh, hard infrastructure or soft infrastructure like planning um, in order to, to be more prepared um, when, uh, as the climate becomes more extreme and we experience more uh, of these natural disasters. And so we, we uh, got some funding and we've put a project together again using Cascadia to um, identify and assess regional gaps and needs around um, uh, integrating climate change considerations into our hazard mitigation and emergency planning processes. 
Um, there's tons of emergency planning that happens, lots of hazard mitigation work. Um, there are good plans out there, but many of them are more backward looking as opposed to looking forward at what climate change is gonna bring. And so we really wanted to do an assessment and see where things stand and identify what the, what the gaps are. And then secondly, really prioritize projects and try to get as many shovel ready implementation projects identified and prioritized and then identify funding for them as, as, uh, as funding becomes available. And this project is on a really fast timeline where the climate change planning process is scheduled to finish up in, uh, in late October and November. This project needs to be done by the end of June because of where the funding came from. Uh, next slide. Um, so Kate talked some about this, but I wanted to just kind of go over some of the climate risks and impacts that we're going to see in terms of thinking about, about disaster response. Um, increased heat, we saw last summer that, that uh, heat dome. Um, how do we prepare our, our citizens and our infrastructure for um, hotter summers, longer and more intense heat waves? Heavy rains, flooding, sea level rise, landslides, you know, all of those things that happen with, with the more extreme storm events that we're, see, that we're gonna be seeing. Um, summer drought and wildfire. Um, wildfire hasn't been a big consideration on the peninsula, but um, as we see more summer drought um, and, and we see uh, warmer temperatures and perhaps more insect um, damage happening, the, that's something we may really need to be thinking about. Next slide. Um, so the multi-hazard and extreme event preparedness. Um, you know, if we have extreme heat, we're going to see stress on, on electricity demand. People may not have access to air conditioning or cooling. Flooding and other extreme events may um, block access to critical facilities or impact critical infrastructure. And more extreme events will lead to more frequent hazardous travel conditions. Um, and, you know, so an example from Clallam County, um, uh, during winter storms this year, um, we actually had uh, landslides that uh, completely cut off access um, to CQ and Nia Bay and took out the water system for, for, uh, for CQ. So, um, you know, if, if you can't get there by, by land, how do you do anything about the fact that they have no water? Um, and so uh, th those are the kinds of things that we may be seeing happen on a more frequent basis. Next slide. Drought and water supply, again, changes in snowpack levels and rainfall patterns may affect our, our uh, water supply, um, including groundwater recharge and reservoirs. Um, we also may have issues with water quality, to toxic algae, um, sedimentation. Um, Anderson Lake is closed again because of toxic algae. Summer low flows and heat events and winter flooding will affect salmon populations. And more frequent drought will stress agricultural and forest lands. What, is our, what does our agriculture look like um, in, in this scenario where we may get even less rainfall during the summers? Um, and, and have issues with access to groundwater? And what will a warming climate do to what, what grows well here if we no longer have freezes um, in the wintertime and if we have warmer temperatures? Next slide. And of course, landslides and erosion. More frequent landslides um, that, that will block transportation may impact homes and infrastructure. Um, and um, may block access to critical facilities. Um, and uh, this, in addition to landslides, we're also gonna see more coastal and bluff erosion happening from those extreme storms um, that, especially those that happen um, with a high tide as well. Next slide. More fre frequent flooding can lead to loss of life, homes and infrastructure. Transportation corridors and bridges may experience failures. Um, and uh, we may see overwhelmed stormwater and wastewater systems as we start to see more extreme rain events. Um, so th that's certainly something that we're gonna, we're gonna be dealing with. Next slide. And then again, wildfires and the smoke from them. So where are we at with this? We've done a document review and gap analysis looking at um, emergency management plans, community wildfire pre preparedness plans, hazard mitigation plans, uh, vulnerability assessments um, that are from uh, both of the counties, tribes, cities, uh, whatever we could find, uh, stuff from the National Park Service and the um, Forest Service as well. We're looking for integration of climate change impacts and projections and disaster resilience projects and implementation details. 
most of those plans have a long list of projects associated with them. Um, and so we wanted to take a look at, at those projects and how many of them might help mitigate climate change problems. Next slide. So the preliminary takeaways from the, the gap analysis, uh, they are reflecting many climate change impacts um, and include strategies and projects to reduce those impacts. Um, but it's largely based on past experience and integration of future climate changes or projections is very limited. Only about a third of the documents looked at that at all. Um, and projects are not ranked or cross-referenced as, as addressing climate change. While many of the strategies would have some climate resilience benefits, they're not necessarily explicitly called out in that way. And most of the documents don't specify project funding sources. So there's a list of projects, but there's no way to, to, to access funding to move them forward. So the next steps are to identify priority projects. The next meeting is gonna focus on refining those projects and identifying implementation details. And in mid-June, we're gonna convene a meeting of funding agencies. And that's gonna highlight projects identified through both, regional, through both of the regional planning processes, both the disaster mitigation and the climate change planning one. So we're looking to bring together um, uh, and we're having assistance from the Federal Reserve Bank and the Washington Department of Health with this, bring together uh, funders like FEMA, like um, the Economic Development Administration, USDA, um, WashDOT, um, the, the kinds of funders who have money to address these, these kinds of needs. And we're hopeful that we can um, start to really match up projects with funding sources and seek out the funding that we need to advance some of these key projects. Thank you, Karen. That was fabulous. And I know we've got some good questions coming in on the chat and we're gonna hold those a minute and, um, uh, and wait uh, until we hear from the next couple of presenters. And on deck now we have Eric, um, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Arlene. I'm going to keep these comments really brief and essentially extemporaneous. Um, I think what you've heard thus far um, kind of sets the stage really well to, uh, to help us all understand the scope and magnitude of the challenges that we face. They're not just challenges that are going to be here next year or 10 years from now. They're going to be with us for many decades, not centuries to come. So the, the challenge is fundamentally systemic. Um, at the Port of Fort Townsend, you know, we're, we are a small port, a small port with uh, you know, limited capacity and yet play a really important role in sustaining the local economy. So I can just tell you what we have begun to do with respect to factoring climate change in our decision here at the Port of Fort Townsend and the kinds of challenges it presents for us. The factoring obviously sea level rise in particular uh, into basis of design decisions for every project that we undertake. Um, trying to uh, ensure that the anticipated useful life of the capital infrastructure that we're constructing is at least as long or longer than the anticipated time frame you know we have available. In other words, if you had, um, if you were expecting really dramatic uh, and uh, um, uh, significant sea level rise over a short period of time, and we're looking at investing many millions of dollars in new infrastructure that would be right in the path of that sea level rise, that would potentially be an unwise decision for the public and port to make. Uh, so we are uh, really committed to making wise investments with the limited resources we have available to us to sustain our local marine trades economy, but to not spend um, you know, bad money after good here. So, uh, I will say that um, 
a huge part of what we uh, are attempting to do really relates to transition and resilience. The having the skills uh, in our community that are represented here at Boathaven uh, as an example, these uh, the people outside my window here are people who know how to build things, how to fix things. And uh, those skill sets are going to be really hugely important in a very different future as we confront these challenges. So as much of the world goes to the gig economy and to a service oriented economy, we're working really hard to sustain not only the character and culture of the community, but also the, the practical know-how that uh, resides here uh, within uh, the fantastic marine trades uh, that we help to support. Um, I will say that uh, we continue to uh, be really deeply challenged as we look at capital decision-making, trying to uh, factor our vulnerabilities uh, uh, in relation to the, the, the myriad changes that have been outlined up to now in, uh, in this discussion. And uh, want always to make sure that we're making wise, de uh, wise um, decisions with uh, the taxpayer's money. One of the things that we are keenly interested in doing and have not yet really found purchase with is uh, also related to transition and res resilience. And that's doing something to really meaningfully support uh, sustaining and expanding local agricultural production. That would help not only um, the, the local community in terms of having more calories grown near to where we all live, but also help to diversify the port's portfolio almost all of which is directly in uh, harm's way due to uh, sea level rise over the coming decades and centuries. So we remain keenly interested and are always looking for opportunities to do that. The Port Commission will be in the very near term uh, updating the port's strategic plan. And I know that we are going to be factoring uh, climate change and incorporating uh, uh, climate related policies, particularly as they relate to um, adaptation uh, into uh, our new strategic plan. So I guess in some, I would say we're a small organization struggling to uh, kind of renew and rehabilitate uh, a whole lot of infrastructure that is, um, you know, at the end of its life cycle with limited resources and with enormous challenges that lie ahead and, uh, and really focusing our efforts thus far on, um, on transition and resilience and, uh, and really look forward to um, the continued conversation and any uh, questions or uh, comments that might come from folks participating this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. That was really insightful. I appreciate that. And um, there's some more interesting questions coming into the chat, so please feel free to continue that while we hear from um, GCD, Emily Mora. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Great. Perfect. All right. So again, my name is Emily Uyamura. I'm an assistant planner with Jefferson County Department of Community Development. And I'm gonna be sharing with you some of our projects that are underway, which will address impacts from climate change, such as flooding, sea level rise, and then also permitting for shorelines. Um, our mission here at DCD is to preserve and, and enhance the quality of life in our county by promoting a vibrant economy, sound communities, and a healthy environment. So I take that to mean as our daily lives are continuing to be impacted by these effects of climate change, there is an obligation we have to protect our communities and to prepare them for these impacts. And we want all people in 
the future to enjoy the benefits of shorelines and living in Jefferson County that we have now and also see how we can enhance it where we can. So the few projects that uh, community development has on the way are from Department of Ecology grants. Uh, the first one is our comprehensive flood hazard management plan that we'll develop for the big and little Quilcene rivers. And then also a sea level rise study and report. And lastly, a shoreline master program user guide to go along with our shoreline master program update. So the comprehensive flood hazard management plan uh, is going to be developed with use from our FCAP grant, which is the Flood Control Assistance Account Program grant um, from Department of Ecology, which just assists with comprehensive flood management planning and implementation. And again, we'll be doing that for the big and little Quilcene rivers. The last time the big Quilcene um, plan, uh, plan was made was over 20 years ago, and there's been a lot of restoration since projects since then. So we want to see how that has affected flooding in that area and also develop a new plan for Little Quail Scene as well. And we will be using uh, the input from stakeholders uh, to help and from these communities to look at impacts of flooding in these areas and to help identify problems and needs and corrective actions that might come from any of flooding hazards or control measures. This will be really useful for our local property owners, businesses, our utility providers, uh, tribes, public land managers in that area for how climate change and these more intense flooding events might impact them. And then next we have our sea level rise study and report. Uh, it was from the Shoreline Master Program Competitive Grant Pilot Program. So this was their first go of uh, making this grant and we were able to get two projects that we applied for um, granted to us. So that was really exciting for our department and it will support our local shoreline planning and implementation. And so implementation is a big part of what we wanted from this grant is how, how can we make these plans a reality and just make them real. So it will address the unknown impacts of sea level rise specific to Jefferson County. There's been more regional um, sea level rise studies done, but how will it impact the rest of Jefferson County as a whole? Yeah. And hopefully uh, when the study and report are finished, these can then inform our other plans, our shoreline master program, our comprehensive plan, all the plans that need to be consistent to reflect these changes and impacts that are happening at an increasing rate. And then finally, we have our shoreline management program user guide. Uh, We've recently, or, final, or we're working on finalizing our shoreline master program, which needs to be reviewed by Department of Ecology. So we're just waiting on that. And with that, there's been some changes to how uh, our regulations are actually put in place. And so this shoreline user guide will be used to make the process of understanding our program easier for the public. So we'll be looking for a lot of public input um, from people who deal with permitting. So this will be a great opportunity uh, for public engagement and collaboration because this is a project that is meant to be a, a public good and be a service um, to everyone so that we can responsibly take care of our shorelines and the benefits of shorelines, which are really important to uh, the values of Jefferson County. And then um, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And then I just wanted to put our contact information here. If you ever feel like giving us a call or emailing us, we're very open to any communication from the public. And I just wanted to point out that we do have a directory that you can find all employees listed on. I don't know if I'm on there yet because I'm quite new, but 
it is pretty easy to find our contact information. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to ask. We're happy to answer them. Thank you, Emily. That is so interesting. And we're going to put um, the slide decks and contact information for everyone. And there's already been a question or two to me about that. Um, as an attachment to what we send out following this meeting. So make sure you guys um, all send that to me. And I'm going to thank you, Emily, and tee up our last presenter before we hit the chat for all those questions. And that is Jeff Randall, PUD. Thanks, Arlene. And thank you, everybody else who have kind of framed what we're going to be dealing with in the future. Um, Kate's comment about global weirding and I think about COVID, it just seems like we're going to have more crises and we're, we're seeing them around the country and we're going to have more of them happening here. So one of the good things I think the community did in 2008 was voting to authorize the PUD to get into the electrical service business. And along with the port and the city and the county, what that did was it took the PUD, which had a $2 million budget, and now we have a $50 million budget. So all that electrical money no longer leaves the county and it stays here. And what that does is it's allowed the PUD to grow from eight people to, again, closer to 50. And all those resources now live here and it enables us to do more water planning. It enables us to do broadband, which we're going after really aggressively. It enables us to control the infrastructure investments where Puget Sound Energy would just do very little out here to maintain a resilient infrastructure. We can focus on what does our community need. And I think the first um, responsibility that the PUD has is maintaining service because if our electric grid goes down, we have broad impacts everywhere and from the city's uh, sewer system not working or whatever else. So maintaining resilient and reliable infrastructure, I think is the PUD's first responsibility and we take it really seriously. And then the second thing that comes to mind that's really changed in recent years is collaboration. And you hear about all the planning that the county and the city and the NODC are doing and the PUD really benefits to be at the table, to get that information, to help us plan appropriately for how we spend all the, our dollars, as well as how we respond to emergencies. And nobody else has brought it up, so I will. But for example, when COVID happened, we established that four governmental entity organization, the Inter Intergovernmental Collaborative Group. And we've worked together to try and maximize the monies that have been coming into the county and how we spend them. And the Sims Way project is another example of trying to collaborate and work to respond to, to issues. And that gets back to electric reliability, the issue of the trees and the, the power lines and the ports activities. So just want to put in a plug for the PUD as a willing and collaborative partner as we deal with these things in the future. And back to Eric Taves comments, ultimately it comes down to what are the resources that we have locally to deal with these emergencies. And I think the community has made when, when we've given them the opportunity to invest, whether it's within the, the IDD additional port funding or voting to have a local power utility, they've said yes. So I think as leaders, as we continue to analyze the information we're getting and then collaborate to try and come up with good solutions, it's a reminder to go back to the community and let them know we've got this new problem, this new opportunity. Um, here's our proposed solution. Can you help us solve it? So. Just some, just some thoughts. So on the electric side, we're engaged locally as well as in the state in trying to adapt to the changes that are happening. And the state has told us, the whole electric industry, that we need to be coal free by 2025. So we're on uh, task to do that. The state will be net carbon neutral by 2030 with the electricity we provide our customers. And then by 2045, have zero carbon emissions and or be 100% renewable by that date. So the PUD right now is already 98.5% carbon free and we're going into negotiations with the Bonneville Power Administration for our next 20 year power contract. So we'll be working with other utilities to get that last two and a half or one and a half percent of carbon out of our uh, electricity. Um, so we, we've talked a little bit about heat increasing in the summer and that will drive additional need for air conditioning. Um, that actually helps the utilities loads because right now we're a winter peaking utility. 
Um, but we're looking at, okay, how do we help our customers with those changes? People who may not have the money up front to invest in a ductless heat pump system. So one of the things we've done is we've applied for $5 million with a zero interest uh, 20 year loan from the federal government that we intend to make a revolving loan that's available to our customers. So we would charge a small percentage interest rate just to cover the administration costs of it. But the idea would be that you could put in a ductless heat pump if you can't afford the upfront costs, use this money in a low interest loan from the PUD uh, to finance that, get the heat pump installed and then pay us back on your power bill over five, 10, 15 years, whatever the appropriate length of time for the return on investment of that device would be. So uh, those would be hopefully at like one to two, 3% interest rate, something like that. So that would help with some of those transitions. And then also we're looking at um, electric vehicle electrification uh, and making sure our grid can support um, the higher demands that we'll have to get the, the carbon out of our transportation mix. And there's lots of opportunities for the PUD to collaborate with our governmental entities and getting more charging stations. And we've participated in, in grant applications to get some high speed charging infrastructure installed. Um, on We've talked about wildfire risk. Uh, we're working on uh, planning for that and increased vegetation removal, um, increasing sea level rise, all these things we're taking into account when we're making decisions on investing in infrastructure. So when we upgrade our infrastructure, plan for those future events. And then um, finally, I think the broadband uh, investment is really important because it's been amazing to me just how many meetings I haven't had to travel to Portland or Pasco or someplace or Olympia to just because now we can do it via Zoom. So the, the PUD is really making that a huge effort to get high speed broadband available to everybody in the county. It will take years to do, but we're off to a good start. We've got about 25 million already in grant funding and we're hoping to get significantly more funds. And thanks to our great staff, um, Will O'Donnell leading the way, um, we've, we've got a head start on most utilities in doing that. So I think I'll just stop there and uh, thanks for letting me join your panel. Perfect, Jeff, thank you so much. And um, I thank you, John, for answering that question in the chat. And um, Kate, I'm going to um, turn this back to you. Spring, um, Spring Farms is, um, has some great questions and see um, where that needs to go for a response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that. Um, the idea of um, requiring mitigation for uh, loss of, of forest and similarly as we do to critical areas, wetlands. Um, and, you know, it's, it is really interesting to think about this. You've just heard from a bunch of government entities um, who I think, you know, feel a responsibility to be moving us in the right direction. And that is most easily and often done with regulation. And, you know, while we support that, we also know that that has some really dramatic impacts on affordability and equity of access to, um, to services, to land, to housing. Um, and that's something we're, we're grappling with. And I, I will say, I think the state is a good partner in recognizing um, the inherent challenge there. But, you know, do we want to make it harder for folks to build housing in Jefferson County right now? No, we don't. And we're actively working to, to make it easier. And yet that can't, we know that that can't be at the expense of, um, of assets that are going to, um, you know, help us mitigate climate change. So it's, uh, in John, just yesterday, I was in a meeting discussing that very idea and, and grappling with how, how do we not create more structures that are just going to be harder for, um, for our residents who are largely uh, low income. Uh, we're seeing increased disparity in um, income right now. How do we not just push the effects onto folks who have the hardest time um, affording it? And yeah, I was going to open it up to anyone else to answer that. John? Could, could I dive in there too? I, I think I, I really appreciate what Commissioner Dean is saying. and would, would wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, the conflict is when, when, when different objectives actually collide and actually counteract each other. Uh, it's like that false argument about mitigation and adaptation of climate change. Which one? It's actually... No, it's both silly and the creativity required to figure out how to do them so they don't undercut each other is really important. Um, but to build off what, what Kate's saying, 
you know, this is, um, it's also something that at a state and federal level, it, I'm not trying to pass the buck up the government structure, um, you know, but the, there's so much more power. And I think that's why we've been advocating to the state for legislative change, you know, a, including uh, the, the Climate Commitment Act, um, which we've, we've argued the last three years, at least in our legislative agenda that needs to happen. Um, and with something like that, that's holistic and it doesn't require, you know, local, um, you know, as much local action, um, you know, that act can be focused on, well, well how do we actually cap and invest on the biggest polluters, you know, and that becomes a source of funding and resource to actually make good things happen. And so instead of pitting small landowners against, you know, housing needs against forestry against, you know, um, you actually think about the system and the structure and how to fund that in a way that's actually um, hopefully a win-win for everybody, except for maybe the person trying to make a lot of money off um, selling fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wanna weigh in on that issue? A tough one and it, it, even tougher in rural areas um you know we, we know that density and urbanism is the easy answer um for uh planning for climate change in terms of land use um and that is you know we we have pockets of that in port townsend but the rest of the county is actually prohibited from um because of growth management and for you know for good reason um uh, and, and that is partly why the sewer project in Port Hadlock is important to the county. So we have another place that can accept density and we can do some of that development um, and not, uh, not rely on um, conversion in our uh, rural areas. Arlene, I'm not sure how you wanna handle raised hands from the audience, so I'll let you decide. <laughs> to um, recognize keys um, to go ahead and, and ask this question directly. Yeah. Um, is there also consideration? I, I know that the schools get funding from timber products or from harvesting the forest in the area. And I'm wondering if that's also uh, in the works trying to change that um, bad source of school funding. I think I'd, I'm probably most in the, the uh, bullseye to answer that question. Um, yeah, so Jefferson County um, recently wrote a pretty strongly worded letter to DNR and to the Board of Natural Resources who oversees uh, forestry policy on state lands, um, really saying we're, we're fed up with having to make decisions. Um, you know, we, we have the ability to weigh in on and in, in, in some cases stop harvests on DNR lands, which we requested and were granted recently. Um, because it's it, it's a zero sum game. If we are you know funding our schools and our fire uh, emergency services uh, based on industrial forestry models, you know we're we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. So yes, very actively involved in that conversation. And uh, just at the beginning of it, I was amazed we were the first county to rural forestry county to say this. Um, and DNR is having to do a lot of head scratching around it. So really important point. Thank you both. Um, I have another question that came in on Facebook that I'm going to, it has John's name written all over it. But before we get to that, Kate, I'd like you to speak about something that ties into this question, which is Car Free Day on June 1st. Sure. And um, I welcome um, anyone else who's um, in on this that might be better informed. But June 1st, Car Free Day, uh, sponsored by Local 2020, a number of employers, major employers in the county are going to be encouraging their staff to uh, do anything other than drive a car uh, to, to work that day, including uh, carpooling. It would be a reduction in number of cars. So um, there will be prizes available, We're talking about doing a competition between city and county employees to see how many more we can get to participate in it. Uh, just a demonstration of uh, the, the ability to use other modes of transportation. Transit's going to be a participant in it. Um, and it's also part of Bike Month, um, which maybe John wants to speak to. Um, yeah, it's, it shouldn't be a day. Of course, it should be uh, every day. Every day is, is a bike to work day for me personally, but <laughs> anything you want to add, John? Oh, I can pick up on that because I used to run Bike Month for the state, well, for a, a group that runs it statewide. You can go to Love to Ride um, and find it and you could join a team. You could do your own. Um, you know, it's really... Um, I think the ethos is less like eat your broccoli and do the right thing and more like, well, actually there's some benefit to your health, well-being, and, 
can actually be a lot of fun. Um, so we're doing that as city team. We've got a team rolling right now. Um, I've, I've stumped up with my very meager two miles to work today on bike. Uh, we'll do that all throughout May. So, so join us. Thank you, John. And, and the last question I'm going to throw to you, I think is a good way to wrap up this fabulously, um, insightful panel. And I thank you all for that. And that's, we had, um, a community member ask the question. So I'm glad to see that you're all doing so much because I think a lot of us don't know that. And, um, but what can we do as a resident of Port Townsend? How do I get, and they said this, engaged? Okay. I would love to jump into that one because it's such a great question. And um, so a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a podcast about climate and infrastructure. Um, I could put it in the chat. It's 20 minutes and it kind of goes into this stuff. And I, I love kind of taking a shot at, um, it, it's kind of, it's challenging. You have to you have to weigh two very kind of almost contrasting things in your mind at the same time. One is that everybody matters and everything we do matters. Um, but if we thought that we're going to solve the climate crisis by doing bike month, um, we're mistaken. Um, and so I think that the individualist approach to making change, while it's important as a it's almost like a gateway to activity and to camaraderie and healthy habits, that's awesome. Same thing with doing the right thing uh, in any you know, aspect of climate change. But if we don't change the structure, all we're doing is kind of giving ourselves congratulatory pats on the back. And I think um, you, know, you could do the two things at the same time, but when people ask to get involved, um, you know, my call would be get involved in the policy making, the advocacy, the collective action to change the system that actually isn't fair for people. It's definitely not fair for the climate, um, and we could do a lot better. So I think there, you know, there, there are technically, you know, things you could do in your own behavior and habits, but try to elevate that up and think big picture how to make change happen. Thank you, Can I just add a little bit? I just add on to that, which is that, um, you know, your elected officials can't do anything unless we have um, the political backing uh, to do so. And so it's very important for our residents to be advocating for what they want. If you are not advocating for these things, it's almost impossible for us to do them. So, uh, you know, engaging in public processes, volunteering with Local 2020, Transportation Lab, um, you know, they, they help inform, they weigh in on our policies formally, but you can do that as an individual too. And I need your backing in order to do the kind of work that we're talking about doing here. Thank all of you for everything you do and for the call to action for our community. I wanna wrap this up by two little reminders that um, the community uh, leadership awards uh, that the chamber produces for the county are on May 21st. There are still a few tickets left and we'd love to sell this out to show our support for those people in the community who did get engaged, who did get involved, who are advocating, and who have spent the last two years really guiding us through um, the, uh, the pandemic, which um, they deserve all of us to show up and support them. So we're hoping you'll do that. And, I, and to follow on that, um, our next cafe is on May 20th, and that's Commissioner Greg Brotherton of District 3. And he's been working on a pilot project with Thin River and with a company um, of Fluid Dynamics and Bueno Systems. And they've been working on ventilation practices. How can we in the future, in a sustainable way, really make our indoor spaces safer, not just today, but for the future? So please join us for that. And again, thank you to all of you for what you do for the community and for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedules to do this. We are thrilled that you are helping. We are engaged in so many levels as a chamber in our community and advocating for all of you at the local, regional, and national level. Um, we're working for you, so please stay engaged and let us know as well what you need and how we can help. Stay safe, stay healthy, and most of all, help all of our communities go through this um, re-engagement process by shopping local. Have a great week and thank you so much. See you soon.